Good evening. We have got Jack Underwood and Tom Wyman, and they are going to speak to each other. They're going to talk, do poetry, and entertain us this evening with thoughts about the recent things that we've been through in the pandemic. Over to you guys. Hello, Tom. Hi there. Hello. 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 I mean, I'm full of um, beans and admiration about your books. I'm more than happy to talk about it, whether or not I'll um, surmise it accurately. Um, we'll have to see. So um, at one point, Tom, you say, I don't know, shall I be addressing it to you? I'll be, address it to everyone at home. That seems like a better, a better way of doing it. <laughs> Tom is interested in the possibility of there being a right way of living. And this interest or desire to find a coherent description of um, such a right way is driven by in the book, his fresh imperative um, as an expecting father. And, and um, obviously the child um, is born as well during the course of the book. Um, so what follows that kind of initial position of, of, of wanting to find this right way of living is a kind of nuanced and capacious and incisive kind of taxonomy of hope, um, which includes hope's opposites or adjacent feelings or positions, um, resignation, despair, cynicism. Um, and Tom draws on um, philosophy principally in the lives of philosophers, Adorno, Fisher, Kant, um, Mirav as well, loads of people actually, um, too many to sort of name here, um, but also a wider net of events and characters in history. Um, it's a really nice section on Sitting Bull and a Plenty Coups, I think. Is my... I, was, I was playing a Coups, but I actually, actually don't know. Yeah, I don't know either. Um, I've never heard that said. So um, uh, Kafka, Corbyn, Obama, Obama's 2008 campaign, um, speech he made in 2004, the Hope Punk scene, which was news to me as well. So some <laughs> um, interesting discoveries there, as well as the most pressing example of Tom's own life and his own family history. Um, and childhood as well, um, and of course his adult life with his partner Edie, as they try and eventually succeed to conceive their first child, a boy who we, I, I understand, we might hear from. Um, yeah, he might, he might decide to. Pro I think Edie's doing a good job of keeping him entertained. <laughs> with quiz he only watches quiz shows on television. Oh, really? now he's decided. Ah. He used to be very into Hey Dougie, and now he's decided he only watches quiz shows. <laughs> so I think he's watching Jeopardy. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Jeff, that's quite a tricky one, that, yeah. Yeah. Um, Right, uh, hang on, where was I? Yeah, um, and must confront a future that is always, well, yeah, so having um, the kind of, the different hopes um, and puzzles and questions and fears that kind of rear up and are always requiring new hope, um, not in a Star Wars way, but in, in the way that kind of, um, that gives fortitude and transformative power um, that affords that possibility, I think, seems to be the thrust. I don't know if that's um, if that's close enough to the mark, Tom. Is there anything you kind of want to correct there? Or well, sounds very accurate, actually. I was expecting, in a way, there'd be more to correct, and we'd have more to talk about later on. But actually, that's a very fair summary of the book. <laughs> um, so well done. Let's see. Let's see if my one's also as fair <laughs> for you. Yeah. Right. Okay. So this is what I wrote. Um, a few weeks after my son Iggy was born, the poet Jack Underwood sent my partner Edie a copy of his debut collection, Happiness, after she put out a request on social media asking if anyone had any poetry books they could spare to send her to read to him, since he was still some age when he could be soothed purely by the sound of her voice. It feels odd to say this, but I suppose this means that Jack Underwood's words were some of the first things my son heard. Um, and actually, out of all the books he got sent, uh, they were by far the best poems for reading to a newborn. So um, you can have that for any future blurb. Um, around 18 months later, I discovered that uh, Jack and I had been spending the past few years working on the sort of same basic book, um, since I just finished a philosophical memoir about the concept of hope, which you've heard about, um, uh, which is itself is something that necessarily arises in uncertainty. Uh, the book is also about becoming a father. Um, and with Jack. <laughs> Um, has just published uh, Not Even This, which is a book about the concept of uncertainty itself, uh, in which his theoretical investigations into uncertainty are juxtaposed with his own experiences of parenting a young child. And um, 
that's what gave us the idea for this event, which um, Conway Hall has very kindly um, uh, hosted. Um, in, in not even this, uh, Underwood, who is also a lecturer in English and creative writing at Goldsmiths, provides us with a litany of reasons to be not quite sure about pretty much basically everything. Uh, nothing can be known, as the wisdom of Carneades of Cyrene goes, which um, provides the book of its title, Not Even This. Nothing can be known, not even this. Um, we don't know who we are. We don't know what really happened in history. Um, we don't know if anything in the physical world even sort of really exists and so on and so forth. Um, uh, despite this, however, we must nevertheless live. Uh, we exist, we've been thrown into existence for whatever reason, and we must at some point make some sort of decision or obviously, in fact, a great many decisions, a vast sort of series of decisions um, that have to do with that. Um, and if nothing else, parenthood, uh, throws us into this in a very visceral way. Uh, when one has just become a parent, one has no idea what one is doing. And uh, Underwood himself uh, marvels at this uh, about the fact that him and his partner have simply been sort of allowed just to look after a baby just because they happen to be the ones who conceived it. Um, and yet, having had this baby, one must nevertheless do something, right? The fact of a baby um, demands at least some action. Um, they make sure of that themselves. Um, so in a way then, um, Underwood has his finger on what uh, struck me throughout the time right when I was reading the book as a sort of a very old philosophical problem. Um, Aristotle distinguished, uh, and many have followed Aristotle in making this distinction between sort of theoretical and practical knowledge, um, knowledge of sort of what is or what exists, which is theoretical knowledge, um, and knowledge of sort of how to do things of what we ought to do, which would be practical knowledge. Um, when we reflect on the former, um, we always inevitably seem to realize that this theoretical knowledge we, in a way has sort of no ultimate ground and we're thrown into all sorts of skeptical problems of the sort which suggests that nothing can ever really sort of finally be ultimately and definitely known. Um, and uh, Underwood's book is, is, is replete with examples that uh, show us this in sort of various terrifying ways so like time and um, physics and all sorts um, but when we reflect on uh, the latter sorts of knowledge practical knowledge um, we often realize that this sort of uncertainty sort of hardly really matters in a way right uh, if someone's screaming for help and visibly on fire for example um, we don't typically stop to reflect on whether in some sort of ultimate sense they're really on fire right we just try and put the fire out right um, and parenthood is very similar to that. It's very similar to constantly being around someone who's on fire, um, <laughs> except that, you know, um, it, well, it's, it's often some, it's often less urgent than that in reality, but it often fe it feels that urgent sometimes when... Yeah, the you know, fire might be poo, for example. Yeah, the fire might be poo, or it might just be the fact that they don't have what they want right now. Yeah. Um, I, I find it very difficult to um, not give my son something if he's screaming urgently for it, even though on a certain level, I know probably he should have it inculcated into him, but you don't have to have everything immediately just because you want it right now. Sometimes you can wait for a biscuit. Um, but if parents had sort of been imperative, uh, but we must resolve uncertainty into practice, then poetry is for method. Um, and for Underwood, poetry is a sort of tool, or uh, I was sort of worried about this word because it might be better to describe it as a kind of toy um, because, as Underwood makes clear, you have to sort of wield it um, playfully and sort of sillily. There's a, a great chapter on silliness um, in the book. Um, uh, uh, it's a sort of tool or toy with which we're able to accommodate ourselves to this sort of endlessly strange, troubling, shifting reality we discover unfolding around us. Uh, and here we can also perhaps invoke the Greeks for whom uh, poesis was precisely any sort of creative, transformative activity. Um, as distinct from uh, techni, which would be a kind of craft proceeding in accordance with an already established pattern. Um, when it comes to something like creating a child, we as individuals don't necessarily know the pattern. And indeed, such is the nature of human life. Um, you know, any human being is born at a certain point in historical time. Um, it's going to be different from you know, 
every other generation at least that's preceded them, um, then um, it's entirely plausible to suppose there isn't really a pattern for raising a human being, right? It's always you've always got to do parenting differently um, depending on where you're in history and also depending on who your child is as well, um, which is something that I, I don't think I reflected on sufficiently before I became a parent is just how much you don't even have to worry about much about parenting because your child so sort of does so like like to, to make, <laughs> sets your behavior in such specific ways um but you sort of almost can't resist their will um uh so we're, we're we're forced to make whatever we can out of a world um ourselves that's the sort of stuff of life right um it's also kind of what i argue in my book too that hope only really makes any sort of real sense as a concept um within um well, I mean, two things. So, firstly, un- well, you know, uncertainty, not knowing what's going to happen, but also our ability to um, uh, exercise a kind of poetic, but it's transformative relationship to the world to kind of make things different to how they previously were. Um, so, anyway, um, I I know that Jack read my book over the weekend, but I read um, not even this uh, about a month ago. So, I might have I might have just uh, things in my memory have lost. So, is there anything you'd like to add to that, Jack? No, I think it's sort of, um, yeah, that's a very good description. I mean, I think in a way kind of, um, yeah, all the, it, it increasingly I felt like um, readers' responses to it have kind of not, not borne the fruit of my own kind of anxieties about it, which is that okay. it's just this insane document full of like, <laughs> Some like head transplants over here, black holes over here, but about Joan of Arc or something, um, yeah. and worry that it's just really too sort of ranging and, and nebulous, okay. and, and which is a bit like my brain. But actually, I sort of like remarkably surprised that people seem to find uh, some kind of coherent thrust. I didn't find that at all. Actually, I found that like everything sort of fit together quite nicely. It actually just felt like a big co- co- continuous sort of letter. To, mm. I mean, it's all written in, but mostly written in the sort of second person to to your child um and it sort of it just felt like it just you know as a, as in conversation one might quite readily flick between Joan of Arc and Black Holes yeah um you know it, it the book does that in a sort of quite natural way mm. um and you realize sort of and they're sort of Joan of Arc and Black Holes end up being linked by feminist and point epistemology <laughs> they do and poems as well and poems yeah. Because, of course, Joan is a sort of poetic construction in the same way that actually a black hole is a kind of poetic. And also the self as well. Um, yeah, yeah. Joan of Arc is someone you identify yourself with in some weird nebulous way. And black yeah. holes are, you know, is it, is that, trying to call this right? We, we are compared to black holes at some point. Um, yeah, few uh, or, are like black holes. I mean, actually, yeah. this is the kind of, the one of the pitfalls of, poetic thinking in a way and, and its strengths really that you can essentially compare you can find yeah a comparison across all, all kinds of different um fields without too much kind of you don't have to really justify those kind of leaps i think like in other <laughs> of the whole point you know that you're being asked to compare something to something else and i feel yeah. like bitterly um short sold when is that a word short sold yeah sold undersold sold yeah. short yeah um when a poem doesn't compare something to something else it feels mm-hmm. like how i don't know how they you know, isn't that all poetry is it's just the art of comparing things to other things i mean that i can go further <laughs> when i do kind of go further and say that yeah. the kind of everything is just comparing things to other things and yeah. that's kind of like all there is <laughs> <laughs> like once you get down to kind of a word being a kind of representation of something else and then mm. a, you know a thought being and, and that yeah that kind of fundamental end i suppose that's where Carnades as well sort of comes mm. in that, that this sort of um being able to um essentially deconstruct most things down to a kind of fundamental kind of, if not relativism, mm. then, but that, but also not n- knowing that that's not an impasse, that that's a kind of, that that actually p- means that you then have a moral and ethical responsibility to, to say what you've made up, you know, um, to, to yeah. sort of say that those, um, yeah, that those comparisons are, are meaningful. Mm. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I think on the language point, and this is something I reflect on over time as a result of looking after a young child, is, mm. yeah, why do, I mean, and also, which I thought, something I thought about a lot when I was a young child, um, is, I mean, why does anything mean what we say it means? I mean, it's just a kind of, like, so language is just this sort of, like, vast array of blah, 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 blah. Like, why, why does that mean, like, and obviously my, my son is not quite two, and he's still very much learning to talk. And sometimes he would like he would just come up with a word for something that's just mm. not the it's just not what it is. Like it's just not the word, right? It's just not the word we've been using. But he would just sort of come up with his own word because he yeah. like, seems unsatisfied. He spends a lot of time seeming unsatisfied with the words I'm using for things and he wants to <laughs> Yeah, that's a better one. Yeah, there is I mean now there's kind of some rather sort of dubious um psychology around like the onomatopoeic effect of yeah. things if i was to draw a shape and call it like a, 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 a shape that was kind of like this mm. and another shape that was kind of like this kind of round yeah, yeah. and dumpy and i said which one is this the spring out and which mm. one is the flumber you know everyone mm. would go all around you know yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there'd be but then of course that's not how language works and how power like controls and violence underpins it and and, and unfortunately, we're the first kind of, yeah, tyrants and purveyors of that kind of reg regulation. But then, of course, like, yeah, <clears throat> the alternative is <laughs> much more uh, yeah. unpredictable. Like, what, What's interesting with Iggy is a lot of his words he meant always have accompanying gestures, especially once he's invented. Mm. So, like, he knows the word for dates now, right? But when I, he first got introduced to dates, he went crazy for them. And his word <laughs> was... <laughs> so, I to do this little thing. Yeah, because I used to split them in half. I used to split them in half to get the stone out and give him his half. And so those are two halves. And whatever the word is, it's just yeah. The thing that comes in between the two halves. I no, it, it is the two halves because the stone is what becomes between you remove it. And it, so it was the action. The, the, if people are listening to this as a podcast, I'm waving my fingers. I think that's the action of splitting it. Yeah, and then it's the word is kind of it's not far from scare quotes. Yeah, it isn't. It isn't far from scare quotes, which is a little bit sarcastic, as <clears throat> a <laughs> yeah. Can I have a date, please? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he used to do this thing where like there's a there's a book he likes called it's called I Am Bat, and the bat really likes cherries, but the cherries get stolen. But then he gets a pear. Right, that's the story. And um, he he used to like to point to the pear and just go. <laughs> or like you know as if like oh yeah it would be really funny wouldn't it if it was a date and not a pair <laughs> yeah. Yeah. and yeah you know it would in a way <laughs> yeah. be funny it would be the same story um, pretty much it's, yeah well I think that kind of I mean lots of games of like replacing things are quite that's quite yeah. important I think for kids and yeah I, definitely yeah um I mean you know, we are we are here to sort of quote from each other's books or from our own, yeah. Okay, um, in a modest way, and I definitely realised that the last section of the book, in my book, is it kind of has this account of removing a the, the bucket from a sandcastle, and not yeah. like the appearance of the sandcastle, but if you put the bucket back on quite carefully, then the reappearance of the sandcastle. It's kind of like the opposite mm. of, the, of the of the cup cup trick where you put something. yeah and i suppose there's when you're a child there's something quite extraordinary about that because yeah you're still I'm, filling in how the world works it's like the fascination of hiding yeah so, i mean all that yeah. yeah but like it's interesting because my because um it, so obviously when he was like you know just about a one year old he would mm. try and hide everywhere because he literally thought he everyone would like disappear if he couldn't see yeah, i love that the covering extraordinary the yeah. too, yeah but now he's got into he knows that he persists and we persist and now he's got this new phase of hiding where he likes to hide behind specific things and make a big performance of us he likes us to just get like, where is iggy where's he gone oh he's like a, <laughs> make a big show of looking in the wrong places before he yeah. bursts out of where he's been hidden where, where he knows we, we've seen it we've we've hidden him yeah. <laughs> where is he uh, yeah. there's, uh, they, there's a similar kind of um trope maybe is to say you're not gonna do you can't do that can you yeah. you know kind of a, a foe denial yeah. kind of um, well, I suppose 
This is when they do it, they feel pleased about the fact that they've done it because they've been doubted. It's quite... Yeah, I think, like, this is sort of an interesting uh, point that relates to the uncertainty stuff, right? Because Mm. dissimulation and, like, pretending, right, is just so much of how children learn to navigate the world, right? You learn to navigate the world through often very repetitively not doing it quite properly Mm. or seeing or forcing other people to do it not quite properly for whatever reason, right? Mm. Um, yeah, so like, but like, I mean, play, play which involves doubt, but which involves getting lost, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I think also like the that's kind of like the rearticulation, isn't it? If we sort of think about like selfhood and the 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 rest of reality as a kind of some is a sort of extension of that i mean there are a lot of different <laughs> views on that um and where that but that line ends if if anywhere but i definitely think that um yeah when you're kind of that oh i forgot what i was saying hang on it's gone now i've got all the caveats to my own point it's kind of like completely removed my own oh, what were we talking about before that uh, dissim- pretend play and the simulation. Oh yeah, yeah, the rearticulation. Mm-hmm. That essentially, yeah. you have to kind of the the most things, whether it's language or or yeah, or yourself or the world, come about through kind of habit. And yeah, you know, habitual is both the thing that kind of brings things into reasonable, controllable. Yeah, um, making things seem similar enough, mm. which of course is an illusion. Um, yeah, because in time as, as far as time is concerned and which is the only access to reality we have um but yeah so this kind of like constantly needing to produce for ourselves and 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 um and and, and re sort of mint and re-emboss those that that version and i think yeah. really all of kind of play but i mean you could say that you know of course you could say that what where does play end you know into adulthood um mm-hmm. that the whole business of the global economy is this sort of grand orchestral performance to kind of keep the economy yeah, yeah. real as you say in the book yeah <laughs> uh, yeah yeah uh, um, but the but, but but with children i think the and maybe this is true i don't know if this is true for you but it seems to be so you think so that that you become aware like whether it's language acquisition or or gesture or, or mm. that how much of that yeah you see it happening in real time that yeah. kind of things you'd heard or read Lacan talking about, you, yeah, see, yeah. you see, like, <laughs> oh, like, they're doing that. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, they suddenly recognise themselves in the mirror, and, like, actually, there's, there's a good bit in your, your book where you're talking about your daughter's kind of self-presentation in the mirror, like, so, like, she likes to shrug her shoulders or something, which you seem to think is, like, performing femininity. Um, yeah, yeah. Iggy, Iggy always sticks out his tongue. He goes, does he? Yeah, when he sees oh. himself. That's how he, like, that's what he, that's, like, how he wants to appear. Oh, like, that's how he wants to appear to the world. Actually, one time when he started doing this thing where um he he like b- likes to bring a book to the mirror and ha- mm. look at himself reading it like to do that that's yeah <laughs> <laughs> so like like a lenin reading his newspaper that's yeah exactly yeah that, in, that was taken yeah um i suppose like i've got like because we wrote down questions for each other which do, is yeah. formal um one sort of question which sort of follows up neatly from that actually is is an example of um jack's daughter playing from the book which which is a stayed with me this scene um where you describe um your daughter getting this rucksack in which she accumulates various sort of treasures which are things like a bit of a takeaway menu or like um you know some rocks or some string or feathers or whatever um and playing this game where she takes them out of her rucksack and then sort of arranges them in some sort of very specific um fashion which you know no one can quite you know you, or you, which, which sort of differs every time and like you're sort of doing over there's got to be like a way of doing it um and you describe what she's doing as a sort of a kind of poetry um and liken it to what she's doing um and, and liken it to what, what you do in your own practice um so i guess uh maybe let's sort of talk more about why uh what she's doing is poetry and also i was wondering like where do you actually think the limits of poetry lie yeah um, well, that's a really, um, it's a good question because it starts with a kind of small comparison, like a, an analogy for poetry, but then leads you to the sort of endless potential <laughs> question of like, where does poetry stop? 
Um, and yeah. Um, so I would say, yeah, why is that poetry? Well, I think because there's a kind of invest, there's an interrogative, there seems to be an interrogative aspect to what she's doing with that arrangement, that when she's sitting in the middle of this stuff, and she, she kind of, she's obviously kind of meaning to mean, I suppose, is the first thing, which makes it kind of a language. Um, there's evidence that even though no, even though she might not know what she means, and we don't know what she means by it, she she does seem to mean to me, mm -hmm. um, and and the positioning seems seems quite sort of like deliberate, and, and so that's kind of where you get that from. And if you try and interfere with it, she she was. I mean, this is um, a year and a half ago now, maybe. Um, she would get very cross about it, and uh, having to sort of deal with the um yeah with the with the meaning of it from an external point of view was was fraught <laughs> with 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 challenge <laughs> yeah. um and so we, yeah having to sort of but so in a way like the kind of the particularity of that arrangement that she seemed to be kind of that also she seemed to be in the center of that particularity um mm -hmm. and that there seemed to be some kind of puzzle into which she placed herself in relation to not just to the world, but the world in, in, in this kind of language. So um, yeah, I mean, once you think of that little bright orange corner of a takeaway menu as a kind of word mm -hmm. that's kind of like taken from somewhere else, from another context and placed into this new context and this, into this particular arrangement, then it does function a bit like a word. Um, in re and how does it relate to the, the, old, the old dandelion shriveled there? What are they kind of, how does one inflect upon the meaning of the other in that unique position? I mean, I can't think really. It, of course, on the surface, it seems like a slightly whimsical um, mm -hmm. analogy for language, but when you get down to it, it's not that much more whimsical than, than us going cow, <laughs> 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 meaning <laughs> cow, you know. Yeah. Um, there's nothing, there's just really the fact that it only really belonged to her that mm -hmm. makes it this kind of, um, this, it's the, sing the singularity of that that language that makes it kind of um but for it, in Wittgenstein would say that means it can't possibly be a language because because you can't articulate it to anyone else well that's why it's a poem you see <laughs> okay right good okay <laughs> so that the, the 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 that it's not pretending to create a kind of um reliable exchange but mm -hmm. it's still it's still a constructed in a way that that for her mm -hmm has some kind of interrogative exchange yeah. process about I suppose it. other people can engage in interpretive work in relation to it, right? If you place it in a gallery, you yeah. could call it a poem. Well, and people could you, take it as well. If you're just trying to kind of tidy it up, you have to kind of <laughs> what can yeah. I get away with? You know, what, right, sure. you, what can I throw away from the from the backpack? Yeah. Um, so there is, yeah. Um, where does that where does it end though where will it when will it end the yeah. <laughs> poem and that's a kind of there's a nice there's a nice kind of equivalent to kind of the question of when you leave life alone there are like life poems i think where you you experience something profound um something about its particularity the fact that it kind of has this has these indices um this has this kind of indexical relation to the world where um, you suddenly there has to be more, there's a kind of reverberance in meaning beyond what it is um, and we all feel those kind of poem moments um, and some of us are more um, well, have an attitude leaning towards them a little bit more than others certainly um, but yeah there's when do you leave it behind um, and really I, mean, I suppose you, this, will, this will be a, lot of, a, a quick story but then I'll ask you a question. So I won't. Right, yeah. um, there's a poet, Peter Scuffham, and he. Um, I was. I've told this story a few times to students, and he. It's the, it's the kind of balmy day like this. That he thinks a storm's coming, and his partner Margaret says, "Oh, can you go and close the barn door? It's about to swing off its hinges." And she, she walks. He walks out across the lawn, and the the sort of patio furniture is kind of being upturned gets there and closes the gate and winds the yarn around which keeps it shut and thinks great turns around and just on top of his house is a nice house he has it's sort of tudor manor house um 
there's a uh, a peacock, which is he had a pe two peacocks, Oberon and Titania. Um, and Oberon was on top of the house in my version of the story. And at that moment, he sees this silhouetted peacock and behind it, this bolt of lightning sort of comes and sort of bisects the shadow. And at that moment, the rain just comes all on at once, like it does sometimes, you know, just sort of, it seems like the, the sort of sky is cracked and then everything falls and he runs. And um, the, the, so this is the call of the peacock, then it's shadow, then this bolt of lightning and then the rain all at once. He runs in and says to himself, I'm never gonna write, never gonna ruin that with a poem. You know? <laughs> and I think there's a point at which your your poetry becomes in would be a kind of, yeah, would be to try and recreate a poetic moment. And that's when a po so I can't say where poet, yeah, where the, the category of poetry ends which is the poetic, which I think is everywhere in life all the time, um, depending on how you look at it. But I think there's definitely an ending, an appropriate ending for me to where a poem should end, which is when the poem should be the poetic event in, in and of itself. When it tries to kind of like to capture um, or to sort of haul, haul the poetic of life into its kind of, its kind of to mine it, you know? I feel like that's, um, that's when, yeah you're kind of it's a bit like saying dude you should have been there you know okay. and which is never as never as rewarding as actually having been there so yeah sometimes the poetry of life actually transcends the the the, the, the reach of poetry and I think good poetry as an event in language and thought should transcend the poetry of life as well or should and mm -hmm. I don't, that, that's a fairly long I don't know if it's a satisfying answer. Well, it's, 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 it's an, I mean, it's an answer. <laughs> uh, I think it's convincing on a certain level. I yeah. mean, I can unpick it more, but let, let's, uh, yeah. I think there's, yeah, we're in the, in the, in the following... Um... I think it's a good answer with which poetry should end, right? Is where you describe the peacock and the lightning and so forth. Yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, yeah, I would, I'm always, I'm basically open to any category being extended mm -hmm. until it's meaningless. I mean, that's, right, yeah. that's, that's also the kind of job yeah. of poet, really. Yeah. Um, you know, um, the sun is a blood orange. You know. Yeah. I've ruined both terms now. You know. <laughs> um, so you mentioned, um, uh, yeah, you mentioned um, earlier on that, this kind of second person um, where we both end up kind of writing in, in, in not even this, I write the whole book to my daughter, essentially, apart from the preface, but um, towards the end of your book, um, as you said, I've just been reading over the weekend, there's this moment when you choose to address your child. Um, and I was, I'm kind of interested in that as a formal kind of rhetorical decision because Part of my, yeah, I suppose thinking from a writerly point of view, um, and most of the questions I have for you are about kind of philosophy as a sort of practice, as a creative practice. What was the kind of decision? Why do you feel the need to? Is that, is it, did you, do you, when you reflect on it, do you feel like it's a sort of moment of sentimental, sentimentality? Or do you think it's got something yeah. more to do with the interruption of a child forces yeah. Us to confront them and address them directly about the world or I mean I think in a practical sense it, it was born out of the demands of having a child so I mean for context that bit where I address a child so when I um when Edie was pregnant with Iggy um I was I wrote a friend of ours got this yeah, I've got it right next to me here baby journal <laughs> Yeah. where you can keep a record of a, child, of a baby's development, right? Hmm. And I basically what I used it for was I just wrote lots of sort of letters in the diary to Iggy before he was born, right? Yeah. Um, our second child's um, gestating currently, and yeah. I don't think about her nearly as much, right? Like, I don't have time. But um, the, uh, the Iggy I wrote lots of letters to, and so, and that... <clears throat> Um, uh, thing at the end of the text, <clears throat> the end of a book, is um, literally just the diary entry, but sort of cleaned up a bit, right? I wrote it while I was eating breakfast in a cafe just after he'd been born and him and Edie were asleep. Mm. Um, and so, and I, you know, I tried writing something else, 
right? But I couldn't because I had a well, when I was trying to finish that bit of a book, he was a few weeks old. Mm. Um, but also, it just nothing else felt sort of right, you know. That the words as they as I wrote them when he'd just been born mm. were the correct. Were, were just, they just seemed like the correct words. I mean, every, every other word I could come up with would just be a diminution of that. Mm. Um, I suppose if you're thinking about it from kind of your sort of standpoint, basically, it's just like, well, you know, it's some, something about those, that particular arrangement of words ended up capturing the, the feeling in a way that I couldn't recapture just because, you know, uh, it was all, I mean, you've obviously just become a father. It's very intense. Mm. And there's, a, there's something sort of nebulous I was trying to articulate then in that mm. moment. Uh, and, 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 I, and I, yeah, I, I, I suppose probably I didn't count quite seize it because otherwise I could just sort of translate other words back into it. Mm. But I can't do that. Well, this kind All of I have is the words. This kind of feeds into my other kind of curiosity <clears> about, <throat> about writing, really, about, about mm. writing essentially philosophy, but with this very personal mm -hmm. um, kind of background, uh, sometimes a literal background noise um, mm. when you're trying to do yeah. that. And, and yeah, and I suppose that the, the writing something down, particularly in a journal, you know, is, is a kind of, is a kind of recording process, but it's also cathartic. And, I, and I'm, I'm interested in, in the, the two kind of, those kind of two kinds of writing in the book, because it's a much shorter section, isn't it? It's only one yeah. little bit. Um, but that feels like de definitely like a sort of cathartic act and a, mo and a moment of kind of more yeah. of a movement towards a kind of intimacy um, and a need to have that kind of moment of intimacy rather than this kind of more cerebral act of categorizing and naming and placing within a field um, and, a, and with citation and, and the burden of proof to some degree. Um, so I wonder, yeah, my kind of second question is, is like, whether actually that, that kind of academic methodology of philosophy, um, more considered kind of um, traditional, yeah. one of a better word, kind of thinking is also cathartic to you. And um, yeah, can it kind of, um, you know, we can't, you can't kind of, poetry doesn't lead you to a place where you can rationalize or re reason with despair. It kind of gives you a language to kind of access your your feelings um mm. but do you think that yeah is, is philosophy have that same kind of poetic but it seems to be actually mm. be more cut more catharsis because it seems to give you more control over your yeah it's, i think actually you know in, the, in my introduction i described poet a poesis as a, as a practice as this, this sort of like um creative transformative practice right so you, i mean you're, you're changing the world by sort of Make by making, right? Mm -hmm. When you're doing poesis, um, why don't you? And you're also kind of inventing that way of changing as you do it. Um, and yeah, I mean, so the way you describe uh, poetry, at least, is poetry is in the. It helps accommodate you to reality because it helps you sort of like let reality be. Mm. Um, in a way, you kind of end up being oriented quite passively um, towards reality through poetry. Um, you get a kind of a wiser. Um, uh, passivity, mm. but you, you're left nevertheless um, still sort of adrift in a way. And I, I suppose my, yeah, my kind of uh, the book is very, is not happy with that um, at all. Um, and one of the things that I describe as being antithetical to hope is that kind of orientation to reality. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah, I, I mean, the poet's yeah. like Adorno. Is that what you're saying? Sitting there, kind of thinking <laughs> yeah. is happiness, while meanwhile the philosophers are actually. Well, I think thinking. I think Adorno is kind of <laughs> right with thinking is happiness because thinking is poesis, right? Right. Okay. Um, and uh, Adorno thought about too. Adorno thought that's what um, philosophy. The point of philosophy is to mm. be able to name what we presently believe cannot be named. Basically, mm. right, um, and uh, and yeah, I mean, if, if philosophers just say we well, can't name that, right? Maybe it's just not trying hard enough. Um, and, uh, yeah, um, 
uh, although it sometimes can be truer to speak mm. to contradiction rather than to anyway. but um, yeah but in, in certainly in 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 my um text um i'm i'm trying to get something through that kind of a, a bit you know, a kind of patrolling sort of conscious relation mm. um with the world i'm trying to get something more like a kind of certainty mm. uh, this is another question i had to ask you which would be what is certainty as opposed to uncertainty maybe we can get that answer um a second i'll try and clear up all the thoughts mm. you had about my um thinking first um yeah i i mean and it does it relates to kind of like differences in the style of the books right which if mm. you read both of them would be aware of which is just you know as, as you say your, your, your book i mean it's, it's obviously it's more like a letter more like a conversation mm. my book's more like a sort of um uh <laughs> sort of it's like a conversation with someone who's not listening to you. But <laughs> it's, um, it's, uh, it's sort of more sort of, uh, yeah, rigorous. I suppose. rigorous yeah, is, I think that's, that's yeah. fair. I mean, I think, I think it's more reasoned, actually, would be a word I would use. Like, yeah. it's kind of, it has its reasoning on the show, and it kind of takes you through. Um, it's reasonable, and it, and, it, and it sort of shows it's working. Um, whereas I think probably my book just kind of blurts out a series of values and um figures that have arisen and says it doesn't show it's working at all and for that, that reason it's sort of more playful so you can as a reader perhaps do more with it um i think that, that it's asked that's asked that's leaving the gaps i suppose this is kind of like um this is the who is it who talks about this is it wolfgang Eiser? i think it is wolfgang Eiser, the critic um, who talked about literary texts having leaving gaps deliberately mm -hmm. because they become a sort of habitation for the reader. Yeah. And of course, like you can't, you 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 can't. You're not allowed to leave those kind of gaps, really. No, and that's something. That's something. That's sort of like just deeply philosophical. I think you know you are sort of like sometimes philosophers sort of arrange their arguments like fortifications. Mm. Um, you know, in case anyone you know ends up, you know, penetrating them, and um, yeah. You know, uh, um, and 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 sort of overthrowing the philosopher from the castle, they sort of castle they themselves. Mm. Um, I think I mean, that is actually you know because obviously the other part of your question was about the sort of the way my personal sort of yeah, I mean, the catharsis is what I, I mean. One of my main kind of interest is whether after a book, writing a book like like yours, you feel like the kind of almost like a kind of homecoming, mm. <laughs> a kind of a whoosh of kind of, or at least a moment of kind of stillness or. Yeah, or, well, I didn't get that because my son was born, but um, <laughs> I did sort of feel it was a sort of, like, I did kind of write it in a way consciously as a sort of self overcoming, I suppose. Like I, I write things down so I don't have to think about them anymore. Mm. So I suppose that is catharsis, right? Yeah. Um, even though it's a very, um, I, my form of catharsis is not very emotive. <laughs> often I mean, it is, you know people say there's emotions in the book and the, yeah, the book. yeah but um but i think very i think quite rationally about my emotions um and uh uh yeah um the uh and i think about them in order to feel them actually to be mm. honest uh and but um but yeah so uh so and, and so there's a kind of like you know i want to sort of like write this Thing which synthesized basically everything I'm interested in intellectually um, into like an argument, but also sort of this act of you know, this sort of preparing myself to become a father by getting all of the sort of noise out mm. and then just becoming, I don't know, just sort of like being able to kind of end, like step onto the ground of parenthood, mm. yeah, in a sort of in a sort of more solid way, mm. yeah, yeah, like Rocky and training, you know, running up the the steps of the, you know, the, I don't know what that is, the museum, is it? I think maybe. I don't know, I haven't seen, I haven't seen Rocky, uh, but I mean, I, I, if, I haven't seen like any famous film, like if you name a famous film, I almost haven't, certainly haven't seen it unless Edie forced me to watch it in the last few years, <laughs> I've never seen it. I'm, like I'm like a Michael Owen of blockbusters, right? Like you can name like, like, uh, like anything that's like not like very obscure, I haven't seen. Um, no. So yeah, because I don't know, I spent too much of, when I could still go to the cinema, being a sort of self-conscious hipster. But. Yeah, only watching. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I kind of, I'm, I'm, I haven't, I'd have, I have enough. I've watched enough films to have a kind of cartoonish kind of 
analogy language, but that's about it. Mm. So yeah. we've we've hit a we've hit a wall here. Well, I know them all from <laughs> The Simpsons, I suppose. But it hasn't been parodied on The Simpsons. I haven't seen it. It's bound yeah. to be. It, it's the montage yeah. of kind of you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I kind of know what you mean. I don't know why he'd be running up, but I know he'd be um, running and stuff. Anyway, um, so yeah, but I was going to ask you what is so uncertainty. I think we can say is sort of fundamental to human existence and to our ability to be at home mm. in the world to do anything. But then, if that's the case, what is certainty, and why would anyone even want it anyway? Well, I'd say that certainty is sort of like the lie that that, that we have to have right. that we that we need to tell, mm -hmm. so that we can have presence, really. Yeah, okay, that's good. Um, I don't think that there's that there's anything wrong with saying that certainty, or even kind of like knowledge, is untrue. Like I think that's really important to kind of be able to admit those fundamental limits like the, the most the biggest realization in this writing it was just finding one of the, the quotes which was um by lakoff and nunez who talk about that as you say the brain isn't an all-purpose device you know it's a very fundamentally limited piece of machinery yeah. that's evolved very you know in this very particular way um for these sets of circumstances um no wonder we can't describe what's at the center of a black hole you know we can we'll never encounter it with our senses and all of our language is a language is is d derives from the cerebral setup that we have for these particular um terranian um, yeah. circumstances and so yeah i think certainty is also kind of it's the kind of rigging up it's the work i think it's the labor of of, of kind of I think it's of the, the, the social I think it's the and, and including ourselves within it you know um finding out yeah it takes work to feel kind of have enough certainty in yourself to not just you know be sad all the time or kind of like you know I think you've got to kind of it's all hard isn't it it's difficulty I think, I think so um maybe it's like there's this quote it's Novalis a German romantic uh, philosopher so the philosophy was the attempt was sort of was homesickness. It was sort of driven by the attempt to feel at home in the world, right? Mm. Um, and if you kind of think about that in that sort of like naturalized sort of way that you're mm. doing, um, you know, basically, I mean, what is it to feel at home somewhere? Well, you know, if we sort of kind if we've evolved in the way that we have our sort of primates, right? Mm. Well, if we feel at home somewhere. I mean, what the home do? It kind of shelters you against the elements. You sort of feel mm -hmm. the attack, right? Um, but so I suppose maybe one meaning of certainty would be that kind of being at home. And like feeling at least but right now for the night at least you're not going to be attacked yeah yeah i think i think so or but i mean that could be from, I, I suppose most of the kind of philosophy and theory that i read i, I did a, a strange degree at art school um called creative and cultural studies which was like creative writing and art 50 percent, and then 50 percent like theory yeah. And the theory we, we were exposed to wasn't really the, the Western tradition of philosophy. It was, you know, it started with Ferdinand Saussure and, um, um, and, and it was post, it was post-structuralism really. Um, we did look at the, the Frankfurt school and, and, um, but, and Marxism and modernity and, and, and that kind of thing. But we, I think a lot of, a lot of just the sort of puzzling that I have is just real. I, I can't actually detach language from anything. I've realized this is almost a sort of pathological thing that I have now. It's like, I can't really trust anything that isn't aware of the flimsy material that it's made out of. I don't mm -hmm. see language as a, as a robust um, enterprise <laughs> or material. Yeah. And so- It's quite paralyzing as a poet. Well, no, it's totally freeing. I mean, if anything, I kind of real, I realize it as mm. a poet, you know, you can have, um, you know, uh, if you look at like, yeah, I mean, I use it all the time. Just sort of just use a word in the wrong context. Fine, if it's sort of if it make me, you know, the neologistic yeah. creative impulse is to do that. Um, partly out of a recognition of the, the the fallibility and the fundamental limits of a kind of system. So, so certainty, I suppose, is is like when you, and and, and maybe when I I do use it in a pejorative sense, perhaps, mm -hmm. and I kind of, yeah. I, I I mean it in those terms when when people mistake the sort of code, the, the, the code for a naturalized reality, mm -hmm. which, is, which is a stifling kind of conservative 
way of thinking that that you know it, it stops that possibility that you talk about throughout your book about being able to kind of imagine something else yeah. so so certainty for me is almost like yeah that it's it's it it kind of it stops the interrogative it mm -hmm. refuses it in a way yeah. um it's an end point you can't have you can't move on from there and so much so so often that kind of it's that 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 situation arises out of yeah disease, a, a sort of horrible political motive to just control and keep still and withhold um like as if meaning is a resource that's being denied um yeah. so i don't know is that a, that's a kind of yeah, a good, yeah it relates to i think it relates quite well to, to themes of my book because in the book i contrast hope with despair Right. Mm. And in a way, kind of what you describe certainty as is sort of despair, right? It's the idea, of like, like basically, if every, if something is absolutely known, then nothing mm. is possible anymore, right? Yeah. Um, or even like in sort of more trivial ways, like if there's sort of nothing new happening, then nothing is possible, right? It's like yeah. I mean, one thing that like I've become sort of hyper aware of recently is like if you go on like social media a lot, as because I've rewired my dopamine signal, so I have to unfortunately. Uh, I'd like to get off it, but um, the uh. Uh, you know, people basically fundamentally the same debates come up over and over and over again. Right? Mm. Nothing new is ever said. It's just the same thing. People are saying the same things over and over again, just getting angry with each other. Right? Yeah. And but this GB News channel, which launched yesterday, basically seems like just an attempt to do that, right? Just have the same internal stupid debates about, like, oh, are they doing enough with the Queen? Over and over with the flag, <laughs> and over and over again. I mean, just people just get like posting about it on social media. These idiots, these, right? You know, I mean, it's yeah, like, yeah, it yeah, just yeah, becomes yeah. a self perpetuating cycle. It's everyone just saying the same thing, sticking to the same thing they're used to. And I think it's become something in like the last year, in part because we were brief to talk about the pandemic and bringing this up. It yeah. has become something I've become very aware of too. People have like, understandably, kind of retreated into sort of old certainties about how the world is, right? How we navigate yeah. the sort of new times. And so, and that's really depressing, right? Um, you sort of feel, yeah, it feels like nothing good can ever happen again because nothing new, because, you, because you're unable to expose yourself to anything new right now. Yeah, well, I think we're in a, in a, in a moment which is, I guess, links to social media in which like we're now hearing from more people all the time, you know, much in, far more if we, with sort of far more regularity and more permanence mm. and consequence yeah. actually, because everything, every tweet is a public, published, revisitable mm. kind of act. Um, it has a much more of kind of impermanent imprint in the world, and that kind of hyper connectivity, that kind of infosphere, like that we're in now, is like full of anxiety, you know, mm. because we, it, we, we're just not, you know. Um, we're built, you know, really for, for sort of, I think there is a kind of limit to actually how much kind of cognitively we can handle in well, terms I of... I think actually, you because know, no, no one sort of on social media is ever, ever able to tell when their enemies are, are joking, right? If you disagree with someone, it becomes impossible to tell if, someone, if, if, if they're, ben, when they're joking, right? Yeah, yeah, I think yeah. In, in your book, you talk very articulately about how well, play and Selena are just parts of how we communicate with each other, right? Yeah, it's yeah. actually how you communicate sort of, in a way, seriously with each other is through play. And if you can't play with each other anymore, because everything you feel, I mean, the permanence of the internet is sometimes overrated, I think, because also yeah, yeah, it's it is. similarly radically impermanent in a way. But yeah, if everything can kind of be marked in this very sort of less than fleeting way, then play yeah, becomes yeah. impossible and silliness becomes impossible. You can't say, it's much harder to say, oh, actually, I didn't really mean that, or now I think yeah. about it, I, I want to take that back, you know. Um, yeah, once everyone can refer back to the text where you have written it, it is yeah, very yeah, yeah. <laughs> <Keeping> their receipts. <laughs> yeah. And, and, it, and it creates this like terrifying kind of bad faith interaction to these kind of, and I just think that the overwhelmedness we have with, mm. with that situation is very like natural. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that in some people who are not like um, necessarily predisposed, <laughs> who aren't like postmodernism, fantastic, let's have more of it. Um, <laughs> which is most people, <laughs> yeah. I think like, then you're like, what can I cling on to? You know, save me. I think actually we're all kind of like, save me from this terrifying cacophony. Yeah. Uh, um, save me from, 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 my, from fear of myself and, and exposure and, and that, that, that very crowded room. And, and to fall back on is, is, is like, I think kind of polemic declarations and i think it's yeah. you know, calcifying of positions comes from this hunger 
for stability in the mm. face of like this new mass infraseric connectivity. I think it's interesting when you kind of go to the sort of language of salvation because I sort of always think I, I sort of think for always think that like people might navigate these problems better with like a sort of some sort of religious derived ethics, right? Because like yeah. sort of like forgiveness, right, as a concept seems like hyper important right now. Yeah. Um, but of course, when it you know when is someone worthy of forgiveness? That's the sort of question people don't you know. Um, but there's something like religion helps us helps help us helps us navigate these frameworks, right? Mm. Um, but that's also something I'm sort of terrified of a book about in the book. But like, what if religion sort of the only thing that we have to navigate <laughs> the, all the uncertainty of the world, right? That doesn't really seem satisfactory because then you need to have faith, mm. you know. Uh, and so, um, and I mean, to have faith you need to have grace, right? So basically, you need God to like you in order to do anything. That doesn't yeah. make sense. That doesn't write to me. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. Um, what do you sort find, of does hope replace that for you? Then, do you think hope as a kind of where does the well, hope has a sort of like murky theological uh, sort, of, uh, sort of theological history as well, right? Mm. Hope is a uh, one of Saint Paul's sort of theological Christian uh, theological virtues. Mm. Um, so, uh, so hope. I mean, some people do think hope requires a religious context in order to be properly understood. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's sort of what, one of the things I'm trying to do in the book is to sort of find a, a secular meaning. Exactly. For it. Yeah, you sort of say that that there's hope that with with Sir Kierke I would never ask Kierkegaard. Kierkegaard. It's Kierkegaard. Yeah, it's it, it's Kierkegaard faith, fundamentally. If you, yeah, I think that's how Danish people pronounce yeah, it. Yeah, That's how it sounds to me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, again, that's a sort of uncertainty, right? You know, some people in like a, a, a pronouncing words mm. in their own sort of native language and you sort of pronounce back you just say back to them what they've just said to you oh, yeah. like, oh well that's just i mean i think that's that's just the fun isn't it you know yeah you kind of that's how re-articulation you know stops it, i mean in a way we say about but... despair and, and the inertia that comes from kind of certain knowledge yeah. um and that yeah that category of despair in in sort of language philosophy i suppose you could sort of say i mean or even just like thinking poetically you could say that if the dictionary worked then nobody would ever need to say anything ever again because yeah, all the meaning has just yeah. been tabulated the taxonomy's there its relationship has been perfected so we should stop yeah. um, whereas of course it's precisely the kind of slippage the mutation saying somebody's Danish name wrong, which mm. which keeps the kind of other thoughts moving, you know. Um, yeah, well, I think it's so fascinating that babies can hear all these letter sounds. You know, <laughs> adults can't, as, as an adult, you sort of just, your brain somehow changes it. Or, or as a your very young child, even, your brain has already changed mm. to only be able to hear certain letter sounds because they're just not... You were ones patient. Not were you, are you, well, you're, you're saying that Iggy's now, he's got... Um, He's kind of in, in a in a big language ac acquisition talking stage. Um, it's, well, he's he's, uh, he's in a sort of language acquisition stage. His talking is hampered somewhat by his desire to invent his own words. No, 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 no. <laughs> okay, right. Talking speed. That's okay. the same. We're all inventing. The okay, sure. He's he talks all the time. It's gibberish. <laughs> he he no, sometimes no, comes no. up with a word. But he sometimes. Brings a word out of a gibberish. <laughs> for a while, it's he, like for a few days ago, it just sounded like he was constantly going teeth, teeth, teeth. And then, because he does say teeth already. Yeah. Well, teeth, but then he, I realized he was saying, he's saying he's saying, and so it becomes she, shoosh. So it was taking him like days to be able to say. I that. think that's all. I mean, I love that phase of language because I don't mm. believe that gibberish exists really. I think there's, yeah. I think it's all gibberish or none of it is. Um, but this is an interesting one question. Deborah's popped up. Uh, I was just, uh, just going to uh, say that I think that's the perfect line. If we were to draw one out of this talk, is um, uh, gibberish doesn't exist. It's all gibberish, and gibberish doesn't exist. Right. That was all gibberish, and also it wasn't. Yeah. yeah okay. Excuse for um, anyone who didn't enjoy what they had to say. Yeah, I think it's been a really good talk because you, we've managed. To, you've gone from sort of. Um, developmental, you know, really early developmental ways of perceiving the world to the most abstract philosophy um, that you kind of learn at a postgraduate level. And they all relate to each other. It's been, it's been really, really great, guys. Could you plug your book before we go? Sure. Books. Uh, I've got Jack yeah. here, but I've got... I've only, I've got an ugly ebook. book um, Well, it's not, it's a lovely looking cover, but um, 
I can do that. Will it? Will it show I've up? Got, well, I've got mine. I've got Jack's. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, we got those. We've got, got those. Yeah. So from the ebook. Infinitely, infinitely full of hope. Uh, it's out now on repeater books. It's it's just been given a second print run, so you can get it with two fewer typos than the original. When my mum read it, her comments were, if "There's a typo on this page. A typo on the other page." Um, <laughs> so you got because you got that. And then, yeah, Wait, you've got Jack's book. Yeah, your book, yes. Yeah, basically, I should have yeah. had to do it before. Yeah, and please buy more of my books so I can get to a second printing and correct a couple <laughs> of guys that my parents sort of also got <laughs> for me. So. Yeah, yeah. Thank you ever so much for being with us today. And um, I'm hoping that the people who've been with us will buy these books from your local independent bookstore. Please also remember that Conway Hall is the oldest ethical society in the UK. It's been there for a long time. It does fantastic work. And I know that we're all poor after the last year and a half. If you have any spare money at all, we'd be very, very grateful for your donations. It would do help us to do the work that we do. Thank you ever so much for joining us this evening and see you at the next one. Bye bye.